Amen. No, you don't have to pray for me because I'm going to pray for myself. Lord, we just pray for Ryan <laughs> and empower him to pray for himself, which he always does. We just thank you for this delightful man, and we just thank you for the word you got in him in Jesus' name. Amen. I know I really need help, so I like praying for me, and because uh, my I'm passionate about praying for myself, so it works well. Let's uh, let's just take like 60 seconds and stand up, say hi to one another. I know this is a let's disrupt the flow here a little bit. Love each other for 60 seconds, and that's it. All right. Okay. Time to love each other silently. <laughs> Find your seats. This is the sound of love. I like the sound of love. So for those who are listening, we're going to pray for me. So stretch out your hand to me again. Jesus, bless me. Anoint me, God. I just pray for uh, just the word that you have, God, this morning would be loosed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to start teaching. Everyone sit down. Stop it. <laughs> We're going to have more fellowship hangout time afterwards. Wow, this, the love of God must be here because you guys really like each other. We should celebrate that. Amen. It's worthy of celebration. Yeah, when, when, when we like each other, that's, that's worthy of celebrating. I mean, we always like each other, but the more filled I get, the more I like the people around me. It's just kind of how it works. Jesus leaks. Um, all right. So we've been on, I wanna, I'm going to talk about getting your stuff back. Does that sound good? Does anyone have any stuff they need to get back? Yeah, one person. All right, you're going to get it. <laughs> oh, there's more than one. Okay. Um, I, I, I can't promise this is going to be the best message I've ever preached. I already did that one. Um, <laughs> I, we, we have, we've had a busy week. We had... Um, we decided this would be a great week while uh, we have all this extra activity going on because half our staff's gone to have uh, one of our friends over and their six kids over at our house. So we have had nine children and three adults in our house and it has been um, a blessing, right? <laughs> but I feel like I was prepared. You know, my wife and I have uh, been running Awanas for the last, like, I think a couple years now almost. 
And uh, I just love, I love hanging out with the kids. I just wish they weren't there the whole time. Um, so I didn't get quite as much time with Jesus that I'd like, so, but I, I know he's got something good for us, so we're going we're gonna to go after him. And uh, so I was thinking about this, uh, getting your stuff back. So, um, you know, as a church, is actually, Mike's been teaching a little bit on this. Uh, I just hate when people take my stuff. And uh, even as a kid, right? You know, it's just terrible when people take your stuff. We had this thing, actually, my youngest daughter uh, had this little girl that was stealing her, literally stealing her lunch. She would start eating her lunch, and then she'd walk over to play, and the girl would go into her bag, pull out her lunch, and start eating it while she snuck away. And um, so we decided to bless her. And uh, <laughs> I love my wife. My wife is so amazing because we found out that she, she's coming home crying and so bummed about this. And, and, and my wife's like, let's just pack two lunches, you know? I'm like, that's a great solution. And, uh, but the, the teachers and stuff already got to it because the problem wasn't that she didn't like her. It didn't, it's not that she didn't have a lunch. It's just that she liked my daughter's lunch better. <laughs> right? So <laughs> ever had that? You know, it's like you had the friends at all the good food, you go over to their house and you eat everything in their cupboards. Oh, thank you for that water. Oh, two waters. Thank you. You're going to be blessed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. Is this a man thing? That, did, did any of you guys have this? Did you, you had the friend's house that had all the good food, right? And because that, that, that was our house too. Like we didn't, uh, we, my family didn't buy snacks mostly because we didn't have a lot of money for snacks. And so we had a friend that like he just, you know, had a great house and a pantry. He had a pantry that was amazing. And the pantry was filled with stuff that we're not supposed to eat. And we'd go in there, and, like, the day after his mom would come, we'd just, like, eat everything. We'd, like, teenagers, you know how it is, and clear out the whole thing, and then she'd have to go back to the store. Lord, I pray you'd bless that woman. I, I um, <laughs> Mrs. Taylor, Lord, bless her in the name of Jesus. They love God, and just pray you just heap blessings upon them for feeding my belly and everyone else in the neighborhood. Amen. So... So I have this thing that uh, I just hate when stuff gets taken. And so, you know, a lot of times I feel like the enemy is coming in and stealing our stuff because we're not catching them, because we're not seeing them. Like, we're, we're going away to do something like my, my little daughter, and he's, like, sneaking in and stealing our lunch. And uh, so, actually, I love the verse that uh, was being shared by Kent Larson, because I was thinking about this verse. Uh, John 10.10, 10, the thief. So this is one that the name's the enemy. Actually, they call him the thief. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So, you know, we've been talking about this, that there's, it's really clear in Scripture, like, that when we're trying to learn this more and more, that the devil's bad and the God's good, right? Like, I can't, I can't always make sense of a whole bunch of different things that are happening in my life, but I've narrowed it down to this thing, devil bad, God good, Right? So if we can sell that thing in our theology and we can kind of get that in our hearts, it really helps out a lot. And, uh, and we have to start off with actually getting a revelation that God is actually good, right? You know, so we spend a lot of time uh, worshiping and talking about the love of God, talking about the goodness of God. And it doesn't mean that everything that God does in our life is easy. I'm not saying that, right? Because there's things that happen in life that are really hard. You know, life is filled with challenges. And so... Uh, but there's a lot of things that come into our life that just we don't have to deal with. You know, some of it is because we're just being dumb. You know, another of it is just because we're following Jesus. You know, uh, when you're following Jesus, you're going to end up in places of testing and hard times. And, you know, like that was a promise in Scripture. We don't quote that one very often. You know, the one that says, you know, trials and tribulations will come. You know, is it that in anyone's promise book? You know, you're claiming that one over your life. <laughs> we normally don't claim that verse, but it's just a part of our walk with Jesus. And so, so I don't know. I have a passion that we would, uh, you know, so when it comes to getting our stuff back, I like, first of all, let's keep our stuff from getting stolen. Isn't that a good idea? So instead of actually just going and chasing all of our stuff, you know, and that can mean like family things going on. When I'm saying stuff, stuff is a big word. Uh, you know, family things going on. Uh, finances, there's all these things. You know, the, the enemy is after everything we have all the time, right? You guys know that? Like, he stinks. Like, he's a big stinker. The guy's no good. And, and I'm not saying this to inflate the devil because, you know, I came out of a background where, where you know, uh, just the kind of the theology and the mentality was that the devil, like, the, theologically we knew God was omniscient and omnipotent and all the omnis and all-powerful and all-knowing. And then, but in, our, in the way that we walked out spiritual life, it's like the devil was bigger than God. 
You know, everywhere I turned, it's like you're watching out for the devil to, like, you know, get you, and you're like, there's a devil behind that bush, and the devil threw the rock at me, and, you know, like, I was driving the freeway, and the devil put the big truck in front of my car, and that's why the rock got kicked up, and you know what I'm talking about? You know, and so that's not healthy, and so I'm not saying that none of those things can happen. Sometimes those things do happen, and that, that's why I'm sharing about this message, you know, but, but we can't, uh, there's two things in, in Scripture that we need to watch out for. One of them is pretending the devil doesn't exist. And the other one is making the devil way bigger than he is. You know, so we have, and I, this is great news, we have a big, big God and a little bitty devil compared to God, right? So this is a part of our, like, belief about who God is. It's clearly revealed in Scripture that we have a big, big God, and compared to God, it's a little bitty devil. Have you ever heard that song before? There's a big, big God and a little bitty devil. All right. <laughs> That's a throwback. I don't know how far back that's going, but that's like probably before I was born. Um, so uh, I want to start off just sharing this, you know, here, the, talking about we do have an enemy, we do have an adversary. First Peter 5, 5 uh, says young, younger men. And so, so Peter actually earlier is addressing actually leaders and he's saying leaders, you know, be, be good leaders, don't lord over people. And then actually switches here in verse 5 and he starts talking to younger men, but anyone who's underneath authority as we're going to see. says younger men likewise be subject to your elders. And all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I'm starting here for a reason. You know, uh, in the church, in church life, there's a beautiful thing that's happening, which we are becoming uh, overall less denominational, which is a beautiful thing. Not that it's, uh, denominations are bad, but this thing that's been growing in the body of Christ is saying, I want Jesus no matter where Jesus is hanging out. Right? Is that how you guys feel? Like, I love that. I love that, you know, I, I have a confession. Sometimes I sneak away from our church to visit other churches because I just want to hang out with them. I can only do it like once every two or three months, but I just, I just love Jesus everywhere he's hanging out. So that, and this is part of who I am. I'm like, I don't care what stream, what river, what denomination I'm feeding from as long as it's good and it's God, right? So this is a beautiful thing that God's doing in the body of Christ. And part of what he's doing is he's actually setting up the body to get more. Like, we can do more corporately, not just this body, but regionally that we could ever do alone. So this is something that God's been doing. Like, there's, there's pastors that are meeting together that are beginning to like one another. But we should rejoice about that. You know, this is... <laughs> pastors, you know, for a long time, the worship leaders would meet together, but the pastors wouldn't go. You know, because worship leaders were like, hey, I don't care as long as we can, like, sing a song about God, I'm good. You know, and the pastors would get together and we'd kind of get in the, the fight about kind of the nuances of our theology and our different ideas and our insecurities and all this different stuff. But that's totally changing. Like, I went to a pastor's meeting uh, about a month ago. And I think there was like over 30 pastors regionally hanging out in the same room, worshiping God and praying for one another. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Woo! So God is shifting something and it's a beautiful thing that's happening. And so... But the battle, though, is we still need to belong to a family, right? Like, we need to be belong to a family. We need to be submitted underneath some sort of authority in our lives. And also, in this verse, when it's talking about being submitted to authority, it says also that we uh, clothe ourselves with humility towards one another. There's this thing where we open our lives up, but we get vulnerable to the people around us and to uh, our leaders. And actually, it says that the result is that we get grace. Does anyone need grace? Man, I need grace. Oh, how I need grace. Verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourself from the mighty of hand of God, that he may exalt you in the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And that's the reason why we can cast our anxiety on God is because he cares for us. And the verse I was going out here, Be of sober spirit, on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing the same experiences are of suffering are being accomplished by a brethren who are in the world. And I want to keep reading because I like verse 10 a lot. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Come on. <laughs> I was thinking about this. I love how you guys get excited about victory verses, right? It's a good thing. Those are good verses to be excited about, you know? And um, I don't want a bunny trail. I got, I got to stay on the path. Stay on the path. Okay, bunny trail. One, one little one. So, so 
I, I'm realizing there's like these staple verses that I keep coming back to. And sometimes I'm like, oh, God, I need to learn like a new Bible verse that says this. And I, I was praying through this. And I felt like God's like, you don't need one. You don't need a thousand Bible verses. You just need a Bible verse that you believe. Right? And so that, and that's what happens. We get verses that become staple, foundational parts of our lives. And it changes how we walk. Right? Because we heard God's voice in it. And so I have these, like, I have lots of scripture memorizes, but there's the scriptures that God spoke to me and they changed my life because I heard his voice, right? And so those are the, the verses that I keep in my arsenal and I fight with them all the time. And that's why you see, you know, Pastor Mike oftentimes, he'll, you know, like, I love that verse he prays about our kids prospering. Does anyone like that prayer? You know, it's a, not a prayer, it's a prayer, but it's a verse. You know, it's a declaration of saying, hey, God, you're gonna, our kids are going to prosper. And I'm sure that came out of a time where he was, feeling unsure about the prospering of his kids, you know? And we get a hold of these Bible verses, and they become weapons in our hand to fight against the enemy. Amen? So we don't need 10,000 verses, though it's great if you've memorized 10,000 verses, and we do a Wannis Club where it's all about memorizing Scripture, you know? But, but we just need the Word of God to sink into our hearts to become a weapon that we fight with. Amen? All right. I feel like we can almost go home. Um, we're going to preach a little bit more. So... So we need community, and so it talks about the devils walking around, like looking, walking like a lion, but, but the good news is there's a better lion, a bigger lion, that's called the Lion of Judah, and he devours people too, but it's for goodness. Amen? So I love that lion. He's not safe, but he's good, and uh, because he messes, he does mess things up, and he's a beautiful one, and so I, I love that. So when we come to church, I, I, you know, Monday nights is a great example because, oh man, have you... Who's been to Monday nights? Is it wild? It's like the wild kingdom. You know, it's like Chris Valton gave a verse about all the animals are coming. You know, and it, it's not going to be a zoo. It's going to be a wild kingdom. And so every time I show up on Monday nights, I'm like, the wild kingdom has come. Right? And, and, and I used to get all freaked out about it because, I mean, people would come in with, like, the craziest stuff going on. But... But I started realizing this thing, that it's the same thing that I realized in the warehouse. It's the same thing for the church. If they're hanging out on our ground, the Lion of Judah is walking around, and he's waiting to devour someone with his goodness, right? And so I'm not afraid. You know, I'm not afraid. I'm not freaking out. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not praying. And so, so one of the ways I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways. So real quick, just talking about, you know, how we can keep our stuff. You know, one of them I was already talking about, the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is an incredible defense against the enemy trying to steal your stuff. Like, when we have the Word of God in our minds and in our hearts, you know, a great example, uh, Jesus. Jesus is a great example. Matthew 4, let's just look at that real quick here. Matthew chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 11. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Th that's not my favorite way to be led by the Spirit. Um, <laughs> we're just going to keep on going. But it says, after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. I would too. Verse 3, it says, and the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now we see actually in this, there's two things. And, and I love that our church emphasizes both these truths, not just our church, obviously. But, but there's two things that are being fought over. And one of them is actually an identity issue. It says over and over again, it says, if you are God's son, Right? And that's the identity part. That's the thing that God settles in our hearts that we're like, oh, he loves me, you know? But there's a second part that is equally important in the place that we fight out, you know, we fight from being loved, but we use the word of God. And so if Jesus did it, oh my goodness, guys, we need to do this, right? If Jesus was fighting with the word of God, we need to be people that are fighting with the word of God, amen? And so sometimes as, you know, uh, as charismatic, and, and this is kind of overall in our spiritual disciplines, you know, we call these things disciplines because, you know, we keep doing them over and over again, and it's not that, uh, you know, this is what got me messed up before. I did the disciplines as a religious activity, not understanding that God dwells in the midst of these things that I'm doing, right? So when I read my Bible, I read my Bible because God's in the Bible, not literally in the pages, but he's speaking through the word of God. I pray because God is in prayer. I'm like, I'm addicted to prayer. I have a prayer addiction, right? Because I find Jesus when I pray. And I love it. Like, I love that he does things, but God is my greatest reward. And that's why I love to pray. I'm looking at the intercessors in the room. They're like, yes, pray, you know? And it's a beautiful thing. And so, so all these different things that we classically call spiritual disciplines, they're, 
they're, they're not only protection for us, but God dwells in the midst of them. You know, I read a, a, a book by Bob Sorge called The Secrets of the Secret Place. Has anyone read that book? Come on. This book is amazing. And, and, and one of the things he starts off with, it, I'm going to go there in just a moment, where it, it says, you know, we, when Jesus is talking about going into the secret place, it says, your father who is in the secret place, he's hanging out waiting for you to come and spend time with you. And he's there, right? He's there. He's waiting for us. You know, and so we get start getting that thing in our hearts that says God is waiting for us. And act, ooh, I'm getting excited about this. Is that okay? Can I be excited? Okay. I like, just nod your head every once in a while. It helps me. Um, so, okay, I'm going to come back to this thing about God waiting for us. But I want to finish reading the scripture. So verse 4, it says, And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the, unto the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, here again challenging that identity, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I like the ending, right? You know, and, and, and for all of us too, like I was reading through this thing about being led into the wilderness, you know, by the Spirit. God does not lead you into testing and trials to kill you. He led you because he wants you to have a victory, right? Like he wasn't leading, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a devil set up. It was a God set up. There was a God ambush in the midst of this. And I love that as Jesus walks through this, there's angels coming and ministering to him. I'm like, I kind of wondered, like, did they physically show up and did he see them? You know, or what was going on? Because, you know, we have angels ministering to us all the time. We just don't normally see them with our eyes, right? So we have, like, we have the worship angel that hangs out on this side, you know, from all the people that are seer people that sees, sees angels. But I know there's an angel that hangs out over here, at least when I'm leading worship. I, I'm not saying that he's not there with other people. I just know because I can feel it. It's so, it's so incredible. Sometimes when I'm feeling weak, I'm just like, God, I need to be strengthened. And I wasn't looking for this. I wasn't developing, like, you know, some weird theology about it. But I started realizing that when I, I start, start stepping back, I would feel the strength come into me. And, and God just, I have a discerning of spirits type gifting. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's something that's, there's, it's like there's someone here that's like laying hands on me. And eventually God showed me it's an angel and he's here to help me. Does anyone need help from angels? Right? So we need them. Like, oh, that's another bunny trail, but we need angels. Let's just say that. Like, and, and it's a beautiful thing, as, you know, as we start realizing we are not alone. We're not alone. We have a great company around us. And, and as we're talking about you know, making sure we hold on to our stuff, and we're talking even about the enemy trying to steal our stuff, the, the angels far outweigh the demons, right? Like if I read, if I read the Bible correctly, that there's two-thirds more angels than there are demons. That's something worthy of celebration. Thank you, God, for that, you know? So, and so sometimes we're like, it's weird because Christians a lot of times talk more about demons than they do talk about angels, you hearing me? Like, isn't that true? Like, so often it's like the, the devil and the demon. I'm like, but there's more angels. You know, are they just all hanging out in heaven or something? Or what are they doing? You know, and so I, I just love that God surrounded us with an, an angelic host. So, okay, that's my verse on the word. So I want to talk about um, worship too. So another, another guard and protection that God's given us is the place of worship. And I want to go back actually before I share this. Uh, Acts 2.42. You know, this is... Uh, you know, the, a foundational verse for, for the, not only the word of God, but what God was doing in the early church. Acts 2.42-43, through uh, 43, it says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place with the apostles. Now, did you get that what was going on here? They were actually listening to things like teaching and having fellowship, and they were praying, and later it says they were worshiping, and signs and wonders and miracles were following. Right? Like, sometimes we're, we're thinking like, oh, we need to press into the next great thing of God, when God's saying, just do the stuff I've already given you. Right? 
Amen? Amen. Like, it just hanging out and being like biblical Christians. And, and I know you guys love the Bible. I'm not saying that you don't. But I'm encouraging you because this is like, I, I feel like we need all these things. We need to be reminded again and again how God uses these things in our lives to strengthen us and empower us. Like, there, there is a battle, you know, that's going on to keep us away from being in the Word of God. There's a battle to keep us away from worship. There's a battle keeping us away from fellowship. Oh, my goodness. Man, the... the you know, the, the times that we don't want to be with people is the time that we need to be with people the most, right? Have you guys learned that? You know, this, this verse, I love this verse, 2 Timothy 2.22. It says, flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So it's not just fleeing from your stuff, it's fleeing into the body of Christ. Like, we need to be around people that are calling on Jesus, who are believing in him and loving him. And that's why we, I mean, that's why I come to church. Like, I come to church because I know that this is a place that people are loving God. And the, the churches that I go to that are grumpy and, like, really, you know, religious and stuff, I don't like going to those places. Like, you know what I'm talking about? You know, like, and God bless them. You know, I'm not, this is not, like, a judgment against them. I'm just saying that I like to hang out with people where they really worship God. Like, we were just talking, who was I talking to? You, yeah, we were just talking about, and, like, I love coming to this church because they really, really worship you know, and it's so beautiful, and we're not the only place to do it, but I praise God that we are a place that does it. Amen? Amen. So, so worship, worship protects us, and there, there's, there's something too, when we, when we talk about this, that, that demons do not like worship. They do not like it. Actually, there's a, one of my favorite testimonies is by uh, Chris Valton, and Chris Valton was getting uh, tormented by this demonic thing and for years and years and couldn't figure out like he thought he just went insane and he had these he thought it was like a mental thing and then uh, you know he hears on a radio one night this guy talking about that the Christians can have like demonic activity in their lives can really mess them up and so he starts you know praying uh, you know about this and God starts revealing you know that hey this is actually a demonic issue you haven't gone insane and so as he prays about this and he contends to get he gets totally set free right you know, but, but I love this part of this testimony. So, so he, at one time he had this dem demonic thing, and he's like a prophetic guy, so he actually sees stuff. And so he'd wake up, and like, there's, there's a couple times this has happened, but one time he'd wake up and see this demon in his room. And so what he did is he felt like God said, plead the blood of Jesus over all the walls, and then worship God because he can't get out. Right? Because he's like, this demon has been torturing me for a long time. It's about, you're about to get a dose of your own medicine. <laughs> now that's, that's kind of, that's a little bit on the like, you know, I, I got friends who like live and breathe in that sort of realm. And I love the prophetic because it's always weird. And I love it because it stretches my faith into thinking about things. And a lot of times it's like, you know, the prophetic brings us awareness in those things that are kind of strange but are totally in the Bible but we forgot that they're real, right? And so I love that. And I was like, oh, it's such a beautiful thing. So, so the, the devil hates worship. Like he really does. Demons hate worship. And so that's why, you know, I worship not because it's a good exercise, but because I need God. I really do. I'm like, I'm desperate for him all the time. Like all the time. And so and I, as I grow, I need him more than I needed him before, not less. Right? Like it's not, it's faith to faith. Like, it doesn't decrease, it only increases. We just need more. You know, so sometimes we get in this mentality like, oh, I'm a mature Christian. I don't need to read the Bible as much. I don't need to pray as much. I don't need to worship as much. That is a total lie. If you're growing in God and become more mature, you need it more than you've ever needed before. Right? Amen. I just feel, oh, Jesus, bless that. So, so when I worship, I, you know, we, I was, uh, we were singing uh, on a Wednesday night, and we were having this time of worship, and I, I read this verse, and I, and I yelled out, worship is winning, you know, and, and someone's like grabbed it, actually Bob Moffat grabbed it, and he, you know, put it up on our Facebook post and stuff, and which is totally cool, Bob, because I would have forgotten that I said it, but worship is winning. When we worship, we win. Did you know that? Worship is winning because, and I'm going to share the verse that I got this out of. I want, I want you to know there is a context for worship is winning, so it's Isaiah 42, 10 through 16. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. That's what we did a little bit of that. We we're kind of spontaneously singing, singing the Spirit. It says, sing his praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it. 
You islands and those who dwell in them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices, the settlements where Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitant of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Do you hear that? Shouts. I like that. You know, the, the Bible, you know, in our culture, we have a hard time with this still, but when you read through the Psalms and the Word of God, like worship is an expression of your whole being right? It's like clapping, and it's shouting, and it's singing, you know, and it doesn't mean that you can't sing quietly, and, you know, right, you know, some of us are in the worship like this still. It's baby worship. I'm holding the baby, <laughs> right? And then some of us are like, you know, we've kind of moved on, and we're like, you know, the, the fish is this big, <laughs> and some of us lie, and we say the fish is this big, I actually stole this from Tim Hawkins. He's a, he's a Christian comedian guy. It's so funny. You know, and then he's like, you know, you got the Mufasa worship. Here you go. And then, you know, like the field goal, it's good. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, the screwing in the light bulb, which is a vineyard thing. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Actually, I, I screw the light bulb in from here. Uh, <laughs> Man, I get that thing sometimes. I'll be worshiping and my hand will start shaking. I'm like, where did I get that thing? You know, it's like, I guess it's like in the vineyard anointing or something. I don't know. So, so more and more when it comes to worship, like, I mean, if you, if you watch me, and, and I'm I, not, not that I, I'm saying look at me. I'm just saying that, that I, as I'm growing in God, I, I'm coming more into that place of saying, I don't care anymore how it looks because I just need God so bad. You know, and it's not only that, but, but I've realized something else is that when I'm, when I'm fighting in worship, and this is true for all of us, this isn't just me as one of our worship leaders, when you're giving yourself extravagantly uh, for God, you're actually releasing breakthrough not only for you, but you're releasing breakthrough for someone else. One person worshiping extravagantly, extravagantly for God can change the atmosphere of a whole room, right? And right now I'm talking about singing, but... but it can be any type of worship. It could be dancing. Like, I love when Kit comes up and dances. It's amazing. You know, bless Kit. You guys know Kit? Where is she? She's probably right there. I love it. She, she, she loves attention. It's her favorite. No, she doesn't love attention. She's like, she's like shrinking down underneath the seat right now. <laughs> and that's what's beautiful about it. It's not a, hey, look at me. It's like, I want to glorify God through this thing. You know, and Andrew came in and he brought flags. I mean, when Andrew brought flags in the church, I have to admit, in the beginning, I was kind of afraid. Um, because I, we were hanging out with some worship leaders, and they were telling a story about flags, where the, the, the flag person, I don't know what to call them, flaggers, flaggets, I don't know, I don't know, oh, the, the flag, <laughs> just strike that from, the, <laughs> the flaggers, they, they had like a 20-foot banner, and... <laughs> I'm going to try to recover from this. They had a 20-foot banner, and they decided they felt led by God to interact with the worship team with their banner. And so the lady, in this case, went up on stage, and she ran past the main worship leader, and the tail of it hit the worship leader in the face and knocked off his glasses. So now he could no longer see your lead worship. Traveled uh, past the, the drummer and hit him. And then land it on top of the keyboardist with all the banner on top of the person. So literally, she single-handedly took out the whole worship team <laughs> for the glory of God. <laughs> so we started talking to these worship leaders like, oh, my goodness, we have these like, guys doing flags and these kids doing flags. And like, oh, bro, I'm so sorry, man. And we're like, no. It's an amazing thing. And actually, the reason why it's amazing is because it's not about, you know, Andrew is just beautiful about this. It's, he's got a humble, submitted spirit. And if we say, hey, it's not time for that, he'll stop doing it. And if we say, hey, can you do that in the back? He'll say, great. And if we say, hey, do up on stage, he said, that's wonderful. Because he's not doing it to be seen by people. He's doing it to worship God. Right? So... So in my worship, and when I'm up here and I'm fighting and I'm jumping and I'm, I'm like, I have this, I have like a clapper disease now, you know, I don't know where I got that, the clapper disease, but you know, I just, and honestly, part of it too is I, it's not only that I feel the presence of God, there's so many times when I'm in a place where I'm like, I just know if I clap, it's going to break something that's here. 
And I can't, I can't put words on it. I, you know, I know the Bible talks about clapping. It's biblical. I can't find a proof text for it, but I just know when I express myself in worship in the ways that God's called me to do, it shifts the atmosphere, right? You know, and so, I, I mean, I guess this wasn't supposed to be my whole message, but, you know, but if we could get a hold of this thing of just pressing in and becoming even more extravagant in our worship, and so maybe you're at baby worship holding the baby, you know, and you're, you haven't even moved into big fish yet, but that's okay. That's improvement, you know? Big fish right here. More Jesus, you know? And so it's not, it's not about, you know, uh, grading your worship. I'm just saying that, that oftentimes that, that the places we experience the greatest breakthrough is right beyond the place that's comfortable for us, right? That thing that David said was so beautiful is saying, I'm not going to give God a sacrifice that costs me nothing, you know? And so Oftentimes, and I'm just saying this is burning out of my heart, just as a worship leader, because I love worship, not because I'm a guy that likes to sing and I like worship. I love how it brings the presence of God near to us in a tangible way. And I love the presence of God. I'll take him over a thousand messages. I'll take him over a thousand songs. I just want him to be present because he's the reward. Amen? Like, I, I just think about how church would look differently. The church is all across America if our number one goal was to have God in our services. Right? You know, I've, it's sad because I remember I, was, I met with a pastor one time, and he said, you know, what's your biggest challenge in pastoral ministry? And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what to do and how to govern a meeting where God shows up. And he's like, what do you mean God shows up? I'm like, he shows up. Like, he does stuff. And he's like, God shows up at your church? You know, and I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> He shows up, what does he do at your church, you know, like, and so, so actually I went there to get counseling because I was a new pastor and I ended up giving him a Bible teaching on the spiritual gifts and that God wants to be present in your service. And he's like, this is great stuff. I'm going to teach on this. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I was reading this verse. Okay. I'm gonna, I want to finish this verse. Is that okay? Are we good? So let them give glory to God here in verse 12. Uh, let them give glory to God and the Lord and declare his praise from the close lands. The Lord will go forth like a mighty, uh, like a warrior. He will rouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. Does anyone want any of that? I have kept silent for a long time. Now, this is, in the context, this is God speaking. I have kept silent for a long time. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now, like a woman in labor, I will groan, I will both uh, gasp and pant, pant. And then it goes on and talks about how God's going to change the whole region, actually literally physically change the region. And so, you know, I was reading through this, and, and I don't know if any of you guys like that song, uh, The Reckless Love of God. So, and I, and I realized that the wreck, that song, when I started worshiping to it, that there was something that, and this is great about the Word of God, it's great about worship, when we start worshiping, we start realizing there's things about God that I don't believe yet, right? You know, or maybe I believe them in my mind, but I don't have faith for them. And so we started singing this thing, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, we could sing it right now. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And then this part. This part always gets me. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. All right. So, but... I love that part because it's actually capturing what this verse is saying, which is that God is in more pursuit of us than we could ever be in pursuit of him. So when we're worshiping God, you know, God's like, I'm just waiting to get you. Right? You know, and so, and I love that. I love the verses that emphasize the bigness of God because it becomes so much easier to approach God. When I'm in that place of saying, I'm not the heavy lifter in this thing, you are. Right? And, and, and God shows himself, like he's, the, he's like the extravagant, passionate one. You know, oftentimes I'm like, oh God, I just want to be so passionate and burn for you. And God just like cozy up next to the fire because I'm the burning one. Right? Like he's, like we could never be more passionate than God is. 
Like, he defines passion. He defines the one, like, it's, I, I love, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Luther movie, you know, and, and Luther's, like, wrestling over translating the word of God, and he's, he's in this one dialogue, and he's, like, talking about the word will, and he's, like, this word will is I don't know how to translate it because it denotes the word passion, and he's, like, defining it, and a, but, but that one part when he captures that, he says the word will captures the word passion. It's not just, a, it's a desire. It's a burning. So when God says, this is my will, He's saying, it's my passion. It's my desire. You know, and so we see that in the verse of saying God, uh, God wills or desires or he's passionate about that no one would perish, but everyone would come to repentance and know him. Right? He's passionate about that. And praise God. I thank God for people like Peggy and people like Heidi that are going out and doing that day after day, week after week. Amen? We just celebrate that Jesus. We just celebrate God. Evangelists have, and we just celebrate people, God, going after your heart and sharing your passions with the lost in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Peggy. And Heidi and everyone else who evangelizes that I don't have on the list. I just hang out, I hang out with Peggy a lot in the warehouse, so I get to see her do it a lot. Oh, I have half my message done. The clock is staring at me. You know, it's, it's kind of tough because the, the clock is so wrong. I have to do math to figure out, like, okay, subtract an hour and nine minutes, and it's actually, uh, all right. I just want to talk about the payback just a little bit, all right? So, so this was all, like, this was all defensive posturing, you know, staying near God, staying in the, in the Word, worshiping, being a part of a community. I didn't actually talk a lot about that, but being a part of community is protection itself. You know, uh, there's, there's blessings in showing up to church week after week and day after day, even if you don't like everything about it. Right? Have you guys ever found a church that you like everything? Maybe it's, it is that church because you've only been here for two weeks. But, uh, you know, and that's what kind of happens. Like, it's like when we get married and we love, we like, I love everything about you until you find the stuff that I don't love as much. You know? <laughs> And then you grow actually in what love is, you know, you learn to love, like real love, you know, love, loving, you know, all the different pieces. And so, and so that happens, we start to kind of, you know, and sometimes, and actually this is my concern, like I don't want us to get into a place where our love looks like that love is only easy because sometimes love is hard, right? But love is always worth it. Love's always worth it. It's the commitment of staying in relationship, whether it's a, a marriage, and I'm not saying there aren't things that happen that blow marriages up, they do. You know, and, and my parents were one of those couples, you know, but, but when we stay in that place of committed and being committed to one another, there's beauty that comes of it because we share not only the pain, but we share the victory, right? Like, I love that because every testimony in this room is my testimony. And I love fighting through, I, actually as a pastor, I just want to uh, tell you, like, I don't get discouraged when you come up to me and share me your, your mess. And if I do, I send you over to Kent and Kathy. <laughs> but most of the time, I'd say like 90 plus percent of the time, you know, I'm not discouraged about it for two different reasons because I keep an arsenal, arsenal of testimonies in my back pocket all the time. And you know, and so when people start telling me their problems, I'm actually thinking through the testimonies of God breaking through in my mind as they're talking about it. Like we have this thing where it's, we're praying for someone who is, uh, they're, they're, they're actually their ex-husband, this, this, this wife who, um, you know, this woman who got divorced uh, and her ex-man was dealing with uh, mental illness. And she was telling about how she was actually going after trying to help her ex-husband save his house, which was a beautiful thing. And she showed up in the Mercy Warehouse and she's like, I just showed up here because I felt the presence of God when I'm in this place. Isn't it amazing? Hallelujah for that because God knows we're messy sometimes over there. Like literally messy, stuff falling off the you know, shelves and stuff. But, um, but she showed up, and so, so she's sharing the story about her husband dealing with mental illness, and I'm like feeling the pain, the compassion, the heartache of it, but I started thinking about it. I'm like, I know more people that have been healed and restored from mental illness and, and battles like that than I know people that are still dealing with it, right? And so I'm like, wait a minute, this thing that, it was like it, the lights came on, like Alvin was sharing his testimony. I have a testimony of just dealing with really crazy stuff. Like I, I thought I was dead for seven years. Right? If you guys know my testimony, which I've shared a little bit, maybe I'll share the whole thing sometime. But literally, I, from LSD and drugs, I thought I was dead for seven years. I had like a Nebuchadnezzar story. 
you know? Don't sign up for that. But, um, but I had, and God walked me through that. And I'm like, hey, you know, this thing that you're dealing with is not impossible because God's done this already in the past. And if he did it for me, he can do it for this person too, right? And the other reason why I don't get discouraged when people share their, te- their, their problems is because I know that I get to labor with them for their breakthrough. And I get to be a part of their breakthrough, and it's a beautiful thing. Amen? Oh, Jesus. Well, that was the first half. I didn't plan on preaching the whole time. Um, so God wants to give us our stuff back, so we're going to pray for that. <laughs> so I'll read, I'll, I'm going to read one scripture about it to, to make it legal. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of scriptures. Uh, so James 5.10, I'm going to read two scriptures. James 5.10, because we find this in the New Testament. It says, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard the endurance of Job and have, have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. I love that. You know, and so, and some of us are in these places where, you know, we're fighting for things in our lives, that we're fighting to get something that, you know, is, that we lost. And the problem is that we're still in the mid, middle of the story. We're not to the end yet, right? You know, and oftentimes, I've seen this over and over again. It's like the tipping point. And I see, like, in a, in a, a microwave, I see it in worship often. I can feel it. It's like we're just at the spot we're about to get breakthrough. And then we, like, you know, there's this temptation to give up. And I'm like, and I, and I can feel it in my heart. I'm like, we press in just a little bit more. There's something big that's coming, Right? And it happens so often in our lives that, that the enemy is like increasing uh, our res- his resistance against us because God's just about to do something really wonderful, right? And so David went through this thing where actually, you know, uh, and, I, and one of my favorite stories is David and, and Ziglag where, where, you know, it talks about that 1 Samuel ch- chapter 30 and, you know, the, the, they come and they stole all this stuff. And David actually, it's, let me just read this part of this verse. I know I, I, lie, I'm, I didn't try to lie. I just, I'm like a biblical person. I said, and finally my brother and I kept going and sharing more verses like the Apostle Paul. So, but it says uh, in 1 first, first Samuel 30, uh, in verse 4, it says, Then David and the people who were with them lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. And the thing that I didn't get in this in the beginning is that David was with everyone else weeping on the ground. It wasn't just the men that were feeling weak and depressed. It was David, too. He was there with them. But David found something in the midst of it. And this is points back to the first part I was preaching. One of the best protections we can do is cultivate skills in our lives so when we really need them in the place of crisis, we already have it cultivated. Right? I know I said that fast, but we gain this arsenal of community and friendship and the word of God and learning to be worshipers. So when everyone's depressed and discouraged and hopeless, we know how to find God in that circumstance. Right? So every time you show up at church and you're worshiping, you're cultivating a skill that's going to help you somewhere else in your life. Right? So, Job, I'm just going to hear land on Job. <laughs> I thought the worship leader was coming to get me. Um, <laughs> we do that sometimes. If you're like, if you go to Mike's Life in the Spirit class, sometimes Mike will be like in the, in the middle of it, and it's like you know, 8:30, and I'll just walk up my guitar and just start strumming. I'm right here, Mike. I'm here for you, you know. <laughs> so I get it. So so going back to the James verse. Uh, I want to just read here, just kind of landing. Job 42, so James is referring to Job, and here in Job 42, I, I got this prophetic word when I was up at the worship retreat that I was like Job. Who likes to get those prophetic words? <laughs> so, but the reality was, is that, you know, I, I actually came through a lot of Job stuff, physical stuff, and, and, and mental stuff, and I actually went through long seasons where I was just battling through incredible things. You know, and so I identified that not as in I'm going back into a Job season, but that God already took me through a Job season. You know, but the reality is that we all have Job stuff in our lives. We have moments where we can't figure out what God's doing. We, we have moments when we're just underneath incredible, you know, hardship. We have these moments where nothing makes sense. We have moments where it seems like the enemy is totally winning everywhere in our lives. Right? Have you, I don't know if you guys have had those times. You know, and it, we have these moments, you know, so everyone has Job's times. So, but here, Job 42.10 this is talking about the end. So it says, remember the end. I, I like that it says, it says, remember the outcome. It didn't say actually in this verse, remember the middle and the beginning. But it says, remember the outcome. 
And in verse 10, it says, The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now, I think that's so key, too, because sometimes when we're, we're in trouble, the best thing you can do is actually pray for somebody else. Right? Pray, pray for, find someone who's dealing with the same issue and pray for their breakthrough. And pray for their breakthrough how you'd want them to pray for your breakthrough. Right? It says, And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Who wants twofold back? Right? I'll take twofold. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought upon him. And each one of them, uh, and each one gave him one piece of money and each a ring of gold. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginnings, and he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels. I mean, I don't know where he put these things, but a 1,000 yoke of oxen and a 1,000 female donkeys. Like, this is like, uh, in, in the Old Testament, he was rolling. Okay, I don't, I don't, verse 13, you know, God gave him like four Mercedes Benzes and, you know, you know, he had 10 houses in, you know, Beverly Hills or whatever, I don't know. Verse 13 it says, and he had seven sons and three daughters and he, he named the first Jeremiah and the second Kazah and the third something else, it's weird. 15, and the land, in all the land, no women were found so fair as Job's daughters and their father gave them an inheritance amongst their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and sons and his grandsons four generations and Job died an old man and full of days. So if you want that, stand up. <laughs> Lord, we just pray that we'd skip uh, some of the beginning and the middle as much as possible. And we just want to go. It's the, the word of God in, in James 5 says, remember the outcome. So that's what we're going to do. God, we're going to remember the outcome of Job's life, God, and how you blessed him more, God, in, in, in the end, Lord. And I just, just want to say over some of you, I feel... I feel like the, there, there's a war that's constantly going on. I mean, there's always a spiritual battle in some place, but specifically I want to highlight uh, just one thing here, is that some of, us, some of you in this place are thinking that God's done with you, but God's not done yet. God's not done in your circumstance. He's not done in your calling. He's not done in that thing that you're fighting for. All right? He's not done yet. He's not done yet. So, Lord, I just pray right now. Actually, so, and if you want to come forward, like, you can just stay in your seats, but if you want to come, if there's something about, you know, this activation and stepping out, you already did once. You, you have baby Mufasa now. <laughs> or you have, you're holding the baby. You haven't even gotten the baby. We, we're not a baby Mufasa. That's later. But I just encourage you guys, if, if you want to come forward, if, if you just, if you're really hungry for some area that you just want, you just need a breakthrough, that you need to get something back from God, and you want it, you want more. So, Lord, I just pray for us right now, God. I just pray that uh, just every place, God, that the enemy's stolen. God, we just pray that you'd give back, God, in Jesus' name, Lord. We just uh, remember the story of Job, and this is not the only story, God. We just thank you that the Word of God is filled with stories uh, of people that went through hardships, God, in the end. They end up more blessed than they ever were before, God. And so we just, get, we just take Job's testimony as our testimony, God, and we say, do it again. Do it again. And just declare that, Lord. Just declare that. Do it again. Do it again in our lives, God. Do it again in our finances. Do it again in our families. God, do it again in our workplaces, God. Do it again. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. We just take the word of God. We take the breakthroughs that we've seen, the people around us uh, that they've gotten, Lord. And we just say, Lord, we just not only use this as hope for our futures, but we use this as fuel for our breakthrough in the present right now. In Jesus' name. God, I pray right now. I ask you in this room, Lord, I pray that you'd raise, raise the faith expectancy that God wants to do something right in this moment. Right in this moment, God, you want to do something. Thank you, God. Mary, are you, are you in this room, the uh, young Mary? Mary, come here. Mercy shared this testimony last time. I want Mary to share it this time. Mary's, I want Mary to share this testimony for you because I feel like it's going to release some faith. You, you got it? You're good. Yeah, come on up here. Mary's being bold right now. Last Wednesday, um, Mercy and I were at Vanguard University, and a friend 
there said that we wanted to pray for healing. The Lord had showed her that this one girl that was um, born with a deformed arm, that the Lord was going to heal her. And so we released a bunch of healing verses for like 20 minutes, and then we um, just told, told them some testimonies, me and Mercy, of, of previous people that we knew that got healed and stuff. And then we just started praying for her for about two hours. And then at one point we asked how she was doing, and she reached out her arms like this. And no one told her to do it again, but she did it again. And by the second time, it like came out like four more inches, and she just fell to her knees. And yeah, and then um, we kept praying for her, and one girl pulled her aside. And then I was like, okay, everyone else, let's just pray in tongues. And um, I was like, oh, wait, does someone need to receive tongues here? And then <laughs> I was like, who wants it? And then two people raised their hand, and me and Mercy got to pray for them. And then they got the gift of tongues, and it was really awesome. And we're still praying for her, so keep her in your prayers. Her name's Kylie, and we want full restoration. And yeah, that's it. That's testimony. So part of the testimony that, that Mercy was sharing was that uh, when she stretched out her arm, she had her clothes modified to be around her um, disability, and so when she stretched out her arm, her clothes didn't fit anymore. So Lord, we just, we just, if you, and if you need a, a breakthrough in your physical body, just raise your hand. So Lord, we just pray, Lord, just, uh, that, that is a tremendous miracle, Lord, and we just say, do it again, God. Do it again, Lord. We just say, do it again right now, God, in our bodies, Lord. You're a God of miracles. You're still doing miracles, God. You didn't quit 2,000 years ago doing miracles. You're doing them in the present. So we just pray you release healing, God, over our bodies right now in Jesus' name. So let's just, uh, I'm going to come around. I want to pray for some of you guys. Yeah, amen to that. But we're going to come around and pray for some of you guys. And uh, I just uh, I just got a couple minutes. I so just be, be extravagant worshipers and worship for your breakthrough as well. Amen.